Gracious God, right now as we prepare to hear your word, this is the, the high point of our time this morning. It's a time when you break into everything that we do, everything that we plan to do, and you speak. And not only do you speak, but you penetrate our hearts even now. Go right to the core of who we are, and with your word, you, you begin to direct our lives. And so, Lord, I just pray for all of us as we hear that word that our hearts would be open along with our ears, that you would um, shut down our minds that are so busy and working on all the things that we have to do and all the chores and all the worries and the cares. And we will tune into what you have to say so that it can begin to change who we are more in the image of Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Our scripture comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 7 through 12. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. You, Jason. Uh, I didn't get a chance to welcome our Facebook folks, uh, and we have a great group that's on Facebook right now, live streaming us, and so welcome to you all. Where's the camera? I don't know where. Oh, hi, welcome <laughs> to everyone that's joining us. There's actually, uh, in the chat, somebody is saying that they're having some audio issues, and they can only hear every fifth word. So my job today is make every fifth word count. Um, when you're at a new church uh, with a new people and you don't know the kind of things that they have been talking about, really have no clue. This is the very first time I've even worshipped with you uh, in this place. You know, what do you get up and, and talk about in that setting? And so I just really went to the Lord and asked for some guidance and really didn't receive any until the beginning of this week. And for some strange reason, as I was thinking about this, my mind went to a TV show, a TV show that uh, ran for 300 episodes and uh, just went off the air in 2018. And uh, yeah, have you heard of this show? Mythbusters. Anybody heard of it? Please, anybody heard of this show? Okay, good. Whew. Well, then you know that this TV show was all about a group of kind of science nerds who um, tested these theories and ideas that would show up in movies and in TV shows and uh, sometimes in real life and ask the question, can this actually happen? And so they would have a ton of fun trying to put these things to the test and either a myth would be busted it was not going to happen, or it was plausible, it could happen, or it was confirmed. Yeah, that actually is real. It's a fact. So who can forget episode 261, right? Am I right? That was the one where they blew up a lot of stuff, because the myths that they were testing are the ones about you can put a bomb in something and then dive out of the way, and you can survive the bomb blast. For instance, if you put, I guess this happened in a movie, if you put a bomb in a file cabinet, in the movie, you could dive out of the way and survive. But that's just not going to happen in real life. They busted that myth. So any of you that's planning on trying that this week, yeah, do not do that. However, however, it was proven, or at least it was plausible, that if you put a bomb in a fish 
aquarium that was filled with water and you dove out of the way, you could survive that. So that's important to know, isn't it? If you put a bomb in a trash truck, in a garbage truck, um, you could survive that, but you would have to jump off of the trash truck before uh, it blew up. Yeah, so this is the kind of show that gives us real life practical knowledge that we really need. Uh, but <laughs> the reason I was thinking about that was because it seems to me there are myths about Christianity, uh, about church, and about how people are supposed to live out their faith as Christians. And I've, I've heard some of these things over the years, and people will say them, many people will say them, and I'll just kind of go, mm, is that true? Is that really true? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to devote several weeks to these myths. And let's see if they're confirmed or they're busted. You want to do that with me? So here's the deal. I've only thought of one, and it's the one I'm preaching on right now. So for the rest of these, I have no clue, and that's where I need your help. So I uh, got a second number. It is my preacher feedback text line. And it's up on the screen right now, so I'm giving it to you. It's there in the left-hand corner, 321 307-4932. You can use that while I'm speaking. And if you know of a myth that you have heard about Christianity, about church, about Christians, and you're just kind of going, I'm not sure that's true, then give that to me and we'll see if we can work it in. Also, you can give me feedback on how you think I'm doing. Now, I'm not going to check it during my sermon, so I'm not going to feel bad if you totally criticize me. I'll feel bad later, but not during my sermon. Um, uh, but give me some feedback, and then also, if you have a prayer request that you'd just like to share with me, then you can do that on that text line, and that's completely confidential, just between you and me. Uh, and then, if you are on Facebook, you can, of course, use the reply, the chat there, and you can give me some ideas, too. So, let's kind of work together on this and come up with some myths together that we can see. So, myth number one. Myth number one is when Christians say that they can best talk about their faith with others, share their faith with others, by leading by example. Have you ever heard this one? I'm going to share my faith with others. Let People are going to know I'm a Christian by my example. Now, immediately you're going, whoa, wait a minute. Craig, you're off to a bad start. Because everybody knows that one of the most important things that you should be doing is setting a good example, right? That's an important part of having relationships with others where you can hope to have any influence or be a leader. If you go to management workshops and you read books on leadership, they're always going to tell you you need to set a good example. The best leadership is by example. And after all, we can find it in the scriptures itself. Here's a couple of verses. Yes, there they are. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers and exact Presbyterians can talk in church. What is it? Example, thank you. An example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. There it is. Here's another one. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Everybody knows this, that we need to be setting a good example. And that's a powerful way that we can communicate to others who we are. However, if you dig in a little deeper, you will realize that there's a difference between setting an example and relegating yourself to your example. Only communicating through your example, relying on your example. Um, one is about integrity. Setting an example is about when you say you value something, when you say you are something, that people can consistently see it in how you live your life, how you act, and how you speak. That's what we would all agree is very important. 
but relying on your example, well, that's just lazy. It's passive aggressive. It's basically an excuse that we come up with to keep people at arm's length and not be engaged with their lives. I'm not, I'm not going to actually engage people. I'm just going to set an example so they can figure it out for themselves. That's essentially what we're saying. And even those who are experts say that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about the value of example. Well, here's an example from the business world. And then I'll give you a quote also from the church world. This is from somebody who's writing in a leadership journal. And he says, we all need to set a good example, but trying to lead by example is weak at best and passive aggressive at worst. A good leader needs to communicate clearly, to set expectations, to take an active role in directing team members. Time to suck it up and own your role. In other words, don't hide behind this leadership by example, get out there and lead. This is from somebody that specializes in church planting or starting new churches and, and training leaders to do that. The problem is you can't lead by example. Your example may inspire others. It may set behavioral standards for others. Your example may even be a prerequisite for authentic leadership, but your example doesn't actually lead others anywhere. Examples don't lead. Great leaders set the example and then hold the team accountable to the standard. There was a study that was done about a decade ago. 30,000 employees were given a survey and they were asked the difference of leaders in their workplace, whether uh, the leaders that just set an example and then just kind of let people figure it out, or those who set an example and then held people accountable, communicated clearly, um, really worked with people in terms of being successful, right? So the difference was amazing. These 30,000, this, this wasn't even close. 30,000 who said that leaders who both set an example and got engaged with their employees and held their employees accountable, they were the ones that had the most favorable employee evaluations, they improved employees' attitudes toward their job. They increased employee motivation and performance, and they decreased unethical behavior. Those who just were satisfied with sort of leading by example didn't get anywhere near those results. It's sort of, it's sort of uh, uh, like you're going to get an army together, and you're going to fight another army and win a battle. And the way that you're going to win the battle is to take the other army to a shooting range and show off how accurate you are at hitting a stationary target. That's kind of like what you're saying when you say, I'm just going to lead by example. You have to engage. You have to ask. You have to start a conversation. There has to be give and take. Ultimately, there has to be support. And there has to be accountability. Yet, over and over, through my ministry, and I've been doing this for 30 years as a professional, I have heard people say, when we talk about sharing your faith, when we talk about uh, demonstrating publicly that you're not just some normal person, you're a Christian normal person, and you are going to demonstrate, you're going to, to share your faith with others, People have told me, well, what I do is I lead by example. And that's clear to me it's their only strategy. That's their evangelism in a nutshell. And what it is, is it's a way to keep from getting engaged with others. Keep from getting involved in the messy stuff. And the hope is that by leading by example, people will, ah, Brian. You're amazing. I want to, do you go to church? Tell me the name of your church right now. I'm going with you on Sunday. Has that happened to you recently? Sorry to put you on the spot, brother. <laughs> I'll give an example of myself. I will tell on myself. 
I have been a proponent of the leading by example technique and strategy for evangelism. For the last 10 years, I was at a church that was in a downtown setting, and my thinking was, I'm going to get involved in the downtown. I'm going to be a part of the Chamber of Commerce. I was on the board of the Chamber of Commerce. I was on the board of the Downtown Association. I was on the board of United Way. I was volunteering. I was getting involved. They, they called me Mr. Downtown in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, and my thought was that if I get involved downtown, one, the people who don't go to church who are downtown will be so inspired by how I get involved that they'll want to come to my church. Secondly, I thought that the church, the people in the church, would be so inspired by how I got involved with downtown, they'd get involved too. Guess what? Neither happened. Not very much. I came face to face myself with the flaw of leading by example approach. I had to do more. I had to get involved in people's lives. It's not enough, it's not enough to show up. You have to be in relationship as well. And this verse, I think, really illustrates what I'm talking about. So long time to get around to the verse, but let's take a look at it real quick. And I'm not going to put it up on the screen because you all have a Bible that is in front of you. And by the way, they just translated the thing into English. Isn't that great? It's in English now, so you can actually read it. It's in there. It's in your Bible. It's in Matthew chapter 7. And uh, I think the verses are in your, your bulletin. Um, I don't remember what they are right off the top of my head. You also, there's these apps that you can follow, like on your phone. You can have the Bible. The only reason I'm saying this is not to make you like this Bible-waving uh, church, but to be a Bible-studying church. And you're not going to get to know the Bible if you're just listening to a preacher talk about it. You've got to engage yourself. Okay, so I'm going to challenge you to open up your Bible and, and study it along with me. So if you're looking at this, what you'll notice right off the bat is that this set of verses is broken down, that Jason read for you, is broken down into two sections. One is about prayer, right? Ask, seek, knock. It's talking about prayer. The second is about uh, relating to others, serving them, being of assistance, being of help to them. So in that, you have what's called the golden rule that Tiffany was talking about. You have love God, that interaction through prayer, and you have love your neighbor, that interaction through being a help and being a service to others. And Jesus concludes by saying, this is everything. Everything in your Bible is in these, understanding and living into these two commands, love God and love your neighbor. Okay, so we got some powerful stuff here. Notice that there is a word, so here I'm going to put you to work a little bit. There is, there is a word that shows up in most translations five times. It's kind of a pivotal word that goes throughout this whole verse, and it's the word ask. Hopefully you see that in there. It, goes, it, it shows up often. It's, it's um, the same word, obviously, in the English, but there is a question about which word is being used in the Greek which is the, the language of the Bible that the New Testament was written in. And that could be many things. The word ask only has one word in the English, but has five possibilities in the Greek. It could be a word that means to inquire, a word that means to seek information. It could be a word that means to interrogate someone. It could be a word that means to plead, to beg. This word, this one, means to demand. That's what's translated ask in the English. That's why the Greek is so helpful, because we get an English word, and it doesn't even come close to telling you what's really going on. It means to demand. It means be assertive. It means I am going to get an answer right now. I am not going to leave until you tell me the answer to my question. That's the kind of asking that's going on in this verse, both in prayer and in relations with others. Interesting. There's another, okay, now I'm going to put you to work. There's another word that shows up a lot. This, this word shows up six times in these verses. Can you tell me what it is? Just if you got it, shout it out. So I know you're with me. Give. Ah, very good. Anybody else get that? 
Give shows up a lot of times. There's also some possibilities here in the Greek, some different possibilities on give. Uh, it's not the kind of giving where I just go up to you and I hand you something and say, here, just out of the blue, it's a transactional kind of giving that is in response to a specific request. That's the kind of giving that's going on here. So you have demanding and then you have responding by freely giving something that is asked for. And then it says what it is that's always given, whether it's in prayer or whether it's in people sharing God's love with others. It is always good gifts. What we give is good. It's pleasing. It's pleasurable. Man, that's awesome. That's what we're asked to give. And let me tell you, there's another myth that's out there that nobody wants to ask Christians anymore about their faith. No one cares. That's myth 1A for the day. Um, that people know about Christianity, they've heard all about it, they've made their decisions, and they don't want Christians coming up and telling them all about Christianity anymore because they are feeling like what they're going to get they don't want. That's wrong. People are asking all the time because everyone I know is asking this question. Is this all there is? In their lives, they are looking around and asking the question, is this it? What I'm experiencing in my life, is this all that there is? I'm telling you, people are asking that question every day. And it's not just a casual question for them. It is the most important question of their life, and they are not finding answers. And we Christians, pardon me, but I think we got the answer. That's what's made the difference for us, is we know that there's more to what we see in the world and what we're experiencing in our lives. There is so much more, and it is good. God has given us good gifts, and He has asked us to join us in being a part of an amazing mission to share those good news, those good gifts with the world. The problem is, is that what the world has gotten from Christians is a lot of other things than what they're asking for. In response to their question, we're giving them judgment. In response to their question, we're giving them a lot of detail and doctrine. In response to their question, we're giving them a lot of Christian speak. When the question is, is this all there is? Oh, there's so much more. That's what we know. They're demanding a response, and we have an opportunity to give them something that they're demanding and have them to see it's good. We know it's good because we're, we, we've already received it. So here is what we can do right now, this week. First, we can engage. Rather than just walk around and hope people pick up our example by osmosis, actually engage people that we meet this week. Ask for a name, learn a name, use a name. Stefano? Yeah. He's brand new, by the way, all the way from a different country. It means something when somebody uses your name. That's who you are. Then you can use that as an entry point to actually asking them, how are you? Listening to their response without judgment, acceptance, not trying to fix them or trying to evaluate them, but actually just receive it and care about what they have to say. Engage with whoever you meet, whether you know them or whether you don't know them, with actual care and actual compassion. And that is always the gateway to a relationship that can go somewhere where you can finally be allowed to hear their question. By the way, is this all there is? Second is to give good things. Give, with what you are giving, make sure it's good. Make sure it's, it's caring. Uh, 
instead of giving a stone, give bread. Instead of giving a snake, a serpent, give fish. Wait a minute. Bread, fish. Have you heard that before? Bread and fish. What's that from? Come on, I'm, yeah, I'm having a brain block. What's it from? It's what Jesus gave, isn't it? Yeah. So if you're wondering, well, what are good gifts? What do I give? Give as Jesus gave. Unconditional love, mercy, welcome, compassion, healing, wisdom, guidance. Whatever Jesus would bring into a situation, bring that. And that will always be good. And then finally, yes, attend to your example. Make sure that there is consistency. We all get off track, right? We all, we all drift. We all get caught up in our stuff. We get angry and frustrated and resentful and depressed. And, and our example starts to suffer. But that's okay. We have forgiveness, we have grace and we have restoration and we can get our example back up to a place where it's, it has integrity with who we are. We just need to monitor it from time to time. So here's what I'm going to have you do. I'm the kind of preacher that is going to give you homework. I didn't mention that to the committee. I probably should have. Lois, did I mention that to the committee? I don't think I did. Okay, well, sorry. I, I am. This is what I'm going to ask all of us to do, me too, is today reflect on this message. Take, take a few moments out of your busy day and ask yourself two questions. One, how did this change me? How did this message from God change me, change my ideas, my perspective? Secondly, what am I going to do about it? So do that today. Come back to what we talked about today and reflect on it. And then give me feedback. There's the phone number up there again. Share a myth with me. I got some good ones out of the early service, so you have some work to do to uh, give me some good ones so we can fill out this and talk about maybe some common myths. Also give me some feedback. And then also test this myth. That's what Mythbusters do. They go out into real life situations and they ask does this work so here's what I want you to do I want you to spend the whole week doing nothing but leading by example and see where it gets you and I want you to come back here and report somebody who came to church with you or wanted to know about Jesus because all you did was lead by example I want you to tell me all about it so we can bust that myth and we can all go on thinking that that's all we have to do all right and so, God, I pray that you would confirm your word in us. Anything that is not of you that I have said, I pray would just blow away. Anything that is of you that is very important for who we are as Christians and as a church, I pray that you would deeply root in us so that it can grow and form us as a people. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.